topic. The coloring contest is back and not much improved thanks to super listener Frank Eck. The contest is simple. Complete one of the pages of the coloring book found on our Facebook page or the Auto Off Topic Coloring Contest Facebook page in any of two mediums, digital using any computer program or analog, be it colored pencil, marker, crayon, watercolor, however you choose. One entry counted per medium per person. Each individual can have a total of two entries, one per format. There will also be two age groups, age 15 and below and ages 16 on up. Links to the coloring book pages can be found on our Facebook page and the Facebook page for the coloring contest. Electronic entries, including scanned entries, can be sent to us via email, autooftopicpodcast at gmail.com. Paper copies can be sent by snail mail to Auto Off Topic Podcast Contest, 83 Lakeshore Drive, Georgetown, Massachusetts, 01833. Note, all hard copies received will not be returned, period. The contest runs through November 30th. The companies and owners groups donating prizes are Mitsubishi Motors North America, Adventure Driven Design, Forced Performance, Palladian Trucks, Northeast Mitsubishi 4x4, Mitsubishi Montero Owners Group of the USA, Florida Mitsubishi 4x4, and Mitsu Nation Facebook Group. Please enjoy this free contest, and don't forget, entries must be postmarked by November 30th, 2017. Good luck. And go. Welcome to episode 56 of Auto Off Topic. Sorry, I moved my mic here. I realized I was talking to the side already. All right, tr- let's try that over. Okay. Welcome to episode 56 of Auto Off Topic. I'm your host, Brad. And I'm your other host, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hey. I was about to say welcome, Andrew, but then I remembered we're in your basement, so. Welcome, Brad. All right, that works better. So what do we have going on with this episode, Andrew? I guess we can get right into Project Car Updates. Yeah, we actually have some this week. Yeah. We were not lazy this week. No, it was um, it was really... Weather's getting weird, because that weird time of year where yep. it can either be really warm or really cold. In the same day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so last week, it was pretty cool on Thursday, but we worked on cars anyways. Uh, it wasn't, like, uncomfortably cold. It no. was probably in the 60s. It was actually... More comfortable to work on the car than we did on Saturday. Yeah. The prior Saturday, where it was, like, super hot. Yep. Yeah, it was, pro- it was probably the 60s. It was no no humidity. It wasn't raining, so it was good. But anyway. And we were, uh, in, we were indoors anyway. It's not like we were braving the elements. Yeah, it was at night. But uh, we, or you helped me swap the radiator in the 89 Montero. Yes, which works. Does. So that's a positive. Also means we have to pay for it now. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it does. So, sorry, uh, Eric, if you're listening, we'll get to, we'll get right on that. We had, I already uh, talked to him. I told him we were going to test drive it for a couple of days, make sure it held up. Oh, okay, excellent. Over the weekend, yeah, a friend of ours had gave a well, a friend of ours gave us the radio. Well, he was he's he has guested on the show. Yes, um, former okay, in that case then former guest yeah. Eric gave us the radiator on the condition that if we put it in and it worked, we could pay him a reasonable amount of money for it. Uh, and if it didn't work, then throw we would the just throw it in the trash and forget it ever happened. So, so far, so good. So we'll uh, we'll take care of him now. But yep, it was uh, definitely a um, a cool thing he did for us, and something that I've noticed in the vintage Mitsubishi world, especially because there aren't very many of us. Everybody tries to kind of take care of one another the yep. best they can. So, and not a lot of uh, competition; it's more camaraderie. Yep. So while you were doing that, I was able to look at the the 99 Montero that we had pushed on the lift a few days prior. Yep. And I thought I would have to take apart the whole front of the engine to look at the where the cam position sensor was. But mm-hmm. I forgot that the top uh, driver's side bank of the engine has the an inspection cover. cover. Yeah. yeah. And I was able with two bolts to get that off. And sure enough, the cam sensor fell out. Most of it fell out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The two ears that bolt it to the head were broken off, still attached to the head, but the rest of it was just came out. So the theory is it was bent? The shutter wheel was bent. Okay. That so spins through the sensor. Spins. Yeah, okay. And was smashing it because you can see where it's been hitting it, and eventually it broke it off. So we're wondering... 
Could that have been that noise the whole time, maybe? It's a possibility. Yeah. I thought for sure that if it was doing this to begin with, that before it completely failed with her check engine light, but I guess not. It well, just it's the totally car. The car's OBD1, right? The car's OBD2. Oh, it was 99. Yeah, 95 was the first year. Yeah. Right? So, okay. That's why, why it has a, yeah. That's why it has a cam sensor. Okay, so that doesn't uh, that doesn't make sense then. It should have thrown a code, I would think. It didn't damage enough to throw a code. Until but if it's making it any kind of a off. noise, you would think there would be something to set off like a knock sensor or something. No. I don't know. That's weird. Yep. Speaking of knock sensors, that was Enzo's tail on the bottom of the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what this does is when you have a distributorless ignition, you know, for those of us that use fuel injection, Brad, I don't know what you're talking about. The I don't even know where your OBD2 started, apparently. So <laughs> it it just tells the ECM which cylinder is at top dead center and which spark plug which to fire. Spark plug to fire. Yep. So this is why it wasn't starting. It was loading up the fuel, but it wasn't firing the right spark plug. Yep. And which it, is probably why it sounded the way it sounded, because it was getting spark, getting fuel, and just it not. Was filling up the cylinders with fuel. Yeah. So hopefully I didn't bend any valves um, because it was still turning over. Uh, what we did event, what we did the other night was I unplugged the fuel pump and then cranked over and it just cranked and spun free. Okay. Because it wasn't putting, it any, wasn't fuel. putting any fuel into it. Yeah. So, well, I really hope that's not the case because that would be super annoying if we bent a valve by dumping too much fuel into it. I don't think it'd be that much fuel going into it, but maybe. Th- I mean, theoretically, hopefully the valves would be opening enough for the fuel to just to be pushed out wash out so yeah i'll see i'm gonna i ordered a new cam gear and a shutter wheel because it comes on one piece okay and i ordered a new since i took the time belt off even though it was like not that old right i ordered a new time belt kit yeah, with a water anyway. pump you might yeah have it's, on it. it's the whole job so. at that point it's cheap insurance yeah i didn't get an oem when i got a gates kit but I've had good luck with We've Gates. We've run Gates once before. Yeah. If I was going to run an aftermarket timing belt, Gates would be what I would run. That's so. the only one I would run. And I already had a newer, the, the tensioner, the OEM tensioner only has 5,000 miles on it. So Didn't you have a Gates Kevlar, like on the Talon or something? Was that a Gates? It's not a Gates Kevlar. It's uh, HKS. No, it's not purple. It's blue. Okay. I thought, I, thought, I thought it was a Gates part or something. I can't remember what, who makes it now. Yeah, it's a carbon Kevlar one. It's a long time ago. That's probably due to be replaced anyway. <laughs> I don't know. what the. <laughs> it's been years. I mean, there's no miles, but it's been years. Yeah, but it's carbon Kevlar. Yeah. And rubber. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, oh, so then on Saturday, uh, I tinted the windows in the WRX because they had a pre-cut kit. Yep. I'm getting better at it. There's less bubbles, I think, today. It still hasn't been like a hot, sunny day yet to let it, the car sit. Like I said, I think once that the sun hits it, it might shrink a little bit, and any of the other bubbles might come out. The other kind I got didn't seem to have... Um, it was like less... It didn't have any bubbles when it was done. So what was the difference between the two kits? One was a normal got, tint, I, one was a ceramic or something? Yeah, I got one with a little higher heat dissipation or blocking because I was just trying something different. So the, it's the same percentage light filtering, but has more Still, heat yeah. blocking. Yeah, properties. it's just a different material. So it's like a pair of cheap sunglasses versus a pair of polarized sunglasses. Yeah, maybe. I, according to the seller, I bought from the same seller. He had like rated them like as like best, better, greatest. Yeah, I nothing, nothing is bad, but there's good, better, and best. Yeah, <laughs> so I tried the the highest one because uh, maybe the second highest or something. I don't remember now, but it was weird because it. By the, I should have started on the passenger side because I started on the driver's side. So by the time I got to the passenger side front window, I was like really good at it. You're like an expert. Yeah. You got to take off the door panels. That's the, that's the On that move. particular car. On every car. I think it's easier. I took them off on the Montero. It was much easier. Oh, okay. I th- didn't think you took them off on the Montero. You don't have to. They give you the slim tools to slide it in between. It's harder to make it perfectly smooth. Yeah. And I scratched the stuff on the back driver's side of the Subaru. By jamming the... Yeah. Tool into the thing because okay. it didn't bother the other stuff before. I didn't even think about it, and then I realized I was scratching it. And it looks like you know, like your dog was like scratching at the right. window, which will eventually happen anyway. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. He's pretty good about not doing that. But uh, I'm going to see how it comes out. If all the bubbles come out and it's fine, then I will finish doing the rear window, and I will. Uh, I'll see if I can get. I'm 
the guy will, I'm sure, will sell me just a single cut of that rear window. For the one that's got a couple of Yeah, and I'll take it off and redo it. Oh, the scratch one, you should say. Yeah. So. Excellent. Getting better at it. And then, you, well, I was doing that. You came by. I did. And I uh, cleaned up the 89 uh, Montero because I used it in the Vermont Overland Rally that we spoke about before. Yep. And I'd been driving it off and on just during the week because I had it at my house just to keep it exercised and the battery charged and just to make sure we don't have any surprises when we do go to sell it. <laughs> so yep. it was just dirty from use, um, but really dirty from the overland trip, obviously. And I decided, or we decided that we wanted to bring it to um, Japanese Car Day. Yes. In order to put a for sale sign on it and just let it be seen. So Japanese car day was Sunday, and the car cleaning day was Saturday, so it made sense, even though we were standing out in the rain cleaning the car. Cause it was like a infrequent rain, though. Yeah, it was supposed to be nice all day, and it wasn't. It was it was rainy. Japanese car day. <laughs> We've removed the potential barking dog from the room. He was fine, and then, like, uh, I don't know, he gets, like, antsy or something. Now, we spent a little more time down here before we started recording. Usually he gets antsy at about 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And we've already been down here probably that long, so that's probably why. Anyway, moving on to more important things. Japanese Car Day was Sunday. Mm-hmm. Sunday, Sunday. And what did we bring to Japanese Car Day this year? Well, I brought out the Galant VR4. I drove the Montero, and my father followed us in his 91 RX-7 convertible. Because it was kind of raining in the morning, so that's right. the, that's that's the that's, rain car. That's his It Might Rain car to bring out. So, Because he has the 84 RX-7 that... Will never see a drop of water in its life, at least in his ownership and the previous owner's ownership. So it's ridiculously mint. So um, let me scroll down here. So we drove down three of those cars, stopped and got breakfast like we always do. Ran into some interesting people at the breakfast stop. I think it's a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a, a moment there. Um, Japanese Car Day is at Lars Anderson. In Brookline, Massachusetts. Yep, the Auto Museum. Yep, it's the Museum of Transportation, if you want to look it up in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also on a big estate that was donated to the city uh, by the Anderson family. Um, The car museum is in the former carriage house. Yep. So it's got stables upstairs and garage bays downstairs. It used to be for horses. They were some of the first people to have automobiles in the Boston area, I guess. That's the story. Yep, because they were quite quite wealthy to have an estate in Boston. And the top of the hill is where the house would would be standing, but it burned down. Correct. And now there is a ice skating rink up there, as well as some pretty amazing views overlooking the city of Boston from the top of that hill. Um but they've maintained it as a car museum since the 50s. I think sometime in the 50s, I yep. forget the exact year. And they have the oldest, I think the oldest car collection in the country. Is that what they say it is? Yeah. And definitely some of the oldest cars. Yeah. They have like some imported French cars from 1909. And they have some pretty wild stuff in the basement that's been with the Anderson family since it was new. Yeah. They would buy a new car whenever the you know wind changed direction because they had money. And they kept them all. Well, they were interested in the technology. Yep, and they kept them all, so they're all still there. And most of them are original, unrestored cars. And they have, like, a rotating uh, exhibit, usually? Yep, upstairs they have a rotating exhibit, which this year is supercars. Yeah. The history of supercars. So there's some stuff in there from pre-war, pre-World War One, right up through current day, or almost current day. Mm-hmm. Um, they have... Uh, of note, the Austin Martin DB4. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty sweet, the green one. I, I It must have been the car that was on the cover of Car and Driver. That's why they had the blow-up of the poster. Yeah, more than likely. And yeah. it had the uh, stickers on the side of it that it ran the uh, Copper State 1000 rally, which is a super high-end car rally. Mm-hmm. Um, they also have a... What is that Porsche that was there? That was the uh, Carrera GT. Carrera GT, that's the one, yep. And then Andrew was obsessed with the... Oh, the XJ220. Yeah. I don't think you've ever seen an XJ220 in person, no. probably. No, that was the Need for Speed 2, like, car, right? Yeah, probably. But it was a dark blue XJ220 that was plated in Massachusetts, actually. So yeah. it's, it's a local car. I've just never seen it around. There's dark gray wheels. That was beautiful. My only issue was the way it was displayed. I wish it was displayed in the center. Yeah, and... it was kind of nosed in, like they drove it and just parked it there. Yeah, I mean, it's a really long car. But it would be really cool to see it from the side profile. 
Right. And, well, the problem I had with it was they had a um, Factory 5 GT. was a GTLM, they call it. Yeah. And it, that was side profile, front and center. And it kind of overshadowed the XJ220 as far as um, the way they displayed it. And it obviously, I don't think yeah. that it should have been. Well, way. the saline probably should have been the other side of the building. Was it a saline or was it a factory five? Factory five, right? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a saline. Sorry. If it was an S7, it'd be even more okay with it. Yeah. Or it's a factory five. It's a kit car. That's, that's yeah. I'm in that it, same vein. Yeah. It had Motigi wheels on it. I mean, yeah. it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. But the, well, uh, the thing that's notable is that they were, they are made here in Massachusetts. So that's oh, part 100%. of the. It's definitely, I, I don't discredit it being there. I just, I just, I'm not happy with the fact that it kind of overshadowed the XJ220. And yeah. How they were set up weird. Yeah. Anyway, but that's what's in the museum. Um, if you go there on a non-car show weekend, still a good take. It's not as big as some of the other museums out there. But like you were saying, it's the history of that museum is just overshadows a lot of the other museums. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely worth worth a trip if you're in the Boston area to head to that museum. Um, going out to the car show back outside of the museum on the museum grounds, they have like rolling grass hills. Yeah, they do lawn events. Yeah, and they, they do different themes also. Yeah, We've themes, talked about this yeah. before. Actually, this was the, I thought of it earlier, this was the topic of our very first episode, was last year's show, one of the things okay. we talked about, and that was uh, the anniversary of our first show is coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so. the first week of November, you were saying. Yeah, so. so on our first episode, we talked about Japanese Car Day. Yes. So we're just repeating ourselves. So we yep. can just shut up, you guys should go back to episode <laughs> one, and forget we even went this weekend. <laughs> but no, it's a really cool thing. They do lawn events, like we've said, they do them all through the summer, different themes. Yeah. Volkswagen Day was last week. and Yeah, that's one uh, that our guest Ken was talking about. Correct. So. So this week was obviously, as we've alluded to already, uh, Japanese Car Day. Which we kind of forgot to talk about. We've just been busy this summer. We forgot it was yeah, happening. We, we didn't even like <laughs> mention we were going. It's one of those things that kind of it kind of snuck up and on like us. like Thursday of last week, we're like, oh, shit. It's yeah, that's this week. weekend. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, so it kind of snuck up on us this year. And it doesn't usually. Usually we're like super prepared for it and have getting cars ready like a month in advance. And this year it was just kind of like I don't have any car. I didn't even bring a car. I drove Andrews Montero. Yeah, so I was way not ready for it this year. I had the the gauntlet was already cleaned because from your wedding photos. It was yeah. from the wedding photos. It got put in the garage after the wedding hasn't been out since. So until the other day, so that was pretty easy to clean up real quick. Yeah, literally rolled it out, dusted it off. It was good to go. Yeah. Well, now now I'm upset that I didn't bring a car. So next year I have to be sure to have a car ready for the show. So all right, well you get all year. Yeah. Well, I'll forget probably again, and we'll be in trouble again. <laughs> um, as with most of the shows at Lars Anderson, the any vehicle that fits the description of the show, Swedish Car Day, Volkswagen Day, whatever, is allowed. Um, but the uh, emphasis is on vintage cars, obviously. Yep. Because that's just, you know, I don't want to see a new Honda Accord at Japanese Car Day, so <laughs> I'd rather see a 79 Accord at Japanese Car Day. I mean, if it is new, it's typically enthusiast car. So, typically. There have been some questionable ones in the past at Japanese Car Day. Hey, you pay uh, your 20 bucks, you can yeah. park your new Corolla. Not not this year. This year is pretty good. I think the only new cars I saw were the Type R Civics, mm-hmm. which as we Type discussed, Uglies, yeah, Type Uglies. They're pretty gross looking. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. I'm I'm sure the chassis dynamics is really really good, but man, they, they are just way overstyled. Yeah, and what way. blew both of us away was the fact that they have 30 series tires on them. It's a 20 inch tire. It's a Honda Civic with a factory 20 inch wheel with a 30 series 20 inch wheels. Like it was a 235, 30, yeah. 20. Yeah. Like that number doesn't even around here compute in my head. You will you will crush that wheel and tire. Yeah, and there was it looked like there was so much space behind the wheel before the brake would be an issue. Like you could put seventeens in the car and it wouldn't be a problem. Well, so the wheel wells are probably giant. Yeah, but you put a bigger sidewall, it fills it out. But you'd probably have sixty series sidewall with the size of the wheel wells. Right, so around an eighteen with a forty five instead of a twenty with a. Yeah. 30, 30, was it 30 or 35? The 30s, right? It was a 30. So small. It's literally a rubber band. Like, I've seen taller sidewalls on donks, I think. It was pretty ridiculous. Um, so th- those were there. There was our friend Jason had his fairly new Tacoma there. Oh, it was that, a brand new NSX that, that rolled But in. that truck is all decked out, like, for overlanding. So it's really cool. It's interesting. Yep. Um, and yeah, there was a brand new NSX that parked right next to the new Type R's. Which were conveniently parked right next to your Montero, yeah. <laughs> showing off the uh, the wares that you could buy for 
two grand versus forty grand for a new Type R. Yeah, or seventy grand with dealer markup. I think it is. So for seventy grand, you could buy one new Type R with dealer markup, or thirty-five Monteros. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting close. I don't think there's that many in the country. Oh, we're, get, we're, we're getting close. If anybody's going to have 35 Monteros, it's going to be us. God, no. So anyway, so yeah, there, there are a few modern cars there. There are a lot of Subarus, uh, like new WRXs. Um, but as far as other new cars went, there weren't too many. I think mid-90s was probably mm-hmm. the meat and potatoes of the show. A lot of imported cars from the, you know, the 91, 92 era. Yep. A lot more than there used to be. It used to be more. You'd go to that show and you'd see a right-hand drive car. Like, Whoa, oh, sweet. That's cool. awesome. Yeah. That's a cool imported car. And now it's like, yep, and here's another one. Yep, there's another one. Yep, there's another one. Not that I'm discrediting them. They're very cool. Um, it's just, it's, it's, you're almost jaded now to them. There's so many of them at these shows. Just yeah. because the era of cars became a lot more desirable. So in you know, the early 90s, the R32s, which there were at least four of, I think, at the show. R32 R3, Skylines. Yep. Uh, the Honda Beat that was there. Um, there was a Toyota Century. It was a 91 Toyota Century. Yep. It was beautiful. It had, like, the doilies in the seats. Um, had the pass-through and the passenger seat folded down. So Did you, I already mention our listener? Not yet. We can get there. Oh, okay. Um, there was the Ford Skyline GT. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Because it was different. With the cloth interior, that was cool. There was the 180SX Silvia with the fixed headlights. Yep. Um, my One of my personal favorites was Is that the, a Koyuki? Is that I, you say it? I don't know. One's what, Zenki or Koki. One's, one's a first gen. One's a second gen. I don't know how it works. Oh, no. One of our listeners will correct us in that. We're not Nissan guys. Sorry. No, but that that's a, just a Japanese thing. That means early or late. Yeah, but it's generally used for that generation, 180SX. Mm, no, you can, use it for, you can use it for any Japanese car. It's a facelift, pre-facelift. All right. Well, I don't know what it is. It was a fixed headlight car. Oh, that's great. all I know. I'm, yeah. I, I can tell you what I want, but I'm wrong, so... Couldn't tell you for sure. My favorite, though, was a second-gen CRX, and it was a genuine SIR that the guy had imported recently. And uh, it was a the, painted at the uh, dark green Toyota Tundra color, the one with the heavy gold metal flake in it. Mm-hmm. car was really cool. Um, I guess he'd been talking to an importer for a while looking for an SIR, and the importer bought a cheap CRX that was kind of beat up and flat black and wasn't anything special. And called him and said, hey, I got a CRX. Are you interested? And he asked him for the VIN. And the kid gave him the VIN the VIN number. And I guess the VIN number, the first three, are what denoted as an SIR. And he's like, I'll be done to buy it. So he bought it, restored it. Um, really cool car. Probably the car from the show that, the, the reasonably priced car from the show that I wanted to take home, mm-hmm. I would say. Uh, we did meet one of our listeners. Speaking of imported cars. Yes. Um, really cool guy named Paul. He drives an R32 Skyline in white. Uh, it was on six spoke Advans. I think they were Advans. Mm-hmm. Really cool looking car. Sat really nice. The white with black wheels is really cool. Uh, had a pretty sweet sticker on the quarter window by the end of the day. Um, he did. But uh, he came up to us and introduced himself. Uh, his name is uh, recognize that car. He is did. Kind of cool. Yeah. It was like a little little little, little moment right there. Um, his Instagram name is Osaka Flaka. Uh, and he's got some cool pictures. He's got some cool cars that aren't Japanese, but, uh, go give him a, go give him a, him a look. And, uh, he's definitely a cool guy. And we thank him for coming up to us and saying hi. And, uh, we're sorry we didn't get to talk to you a little longer, Paul, because we were really busy just kind of chatting with all friends we hadn't seen in a while and yep. looking at cars. And I wish we got to hang out a little more. We'll see you at the next show for sure. <laughs> all right. So I have it. I have it here. What's that? I was right. Half right. So Zenki, pre facelift. Okay. Koyuki, facelift model. So which one was that car? I believe it was a Zenki. I think that's the pre facelift. I, I think I think it was an early car. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because if it was imported to this country, it's a ninety one or older. Yeah. And that chassis came out in like eighty nine. So that would probably be an early car. Yeah. That either that, way, cool to see it. That's what that is. Oh, we forgot the most important of all of the right hand drive cars of the show. The early Mazda Cosmo. Yeah. Like a 67, I would think. Oh, yeah. I'd never seen one in person. Yeah, that car was absolutely stunning. I'd never seen one in red either. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful car. That's the first rotary uh, Mazda. Mm -hmm. Really cool looking car. 
That was really cool. And the AutoZam, you say that? Oh, yeah. The AutoZam was that AZ1? Yep. Yeah, it was a red on gray. That's the gullwing door car that Andrew's obsessed with. Mm-hmm. Mostly because they just want a gullwing door car. But you don't want a DeLorean? No. Right. So what else and I can't af- And I can't afford a 300 SL? Yeah, oh, yeah. So. so what else are you going to buy? You try, try to find an Eclipse or a Starion. They made a few of those. Or a Tesla Model X, which I don't really want. Nope. That's only the rear doors anyway. So that's Yeah. Fine. So, yeah, you're pretty much limited to an AZ1. Or the Toyota Serra is kind of a hybrid. Is it? It kind of has like a, it's a front hinged. It kind of mm. opens up at an angle. I just want to roll up and open the door and look at my watch. <laughs> well, they need a DeLorean, so why are you bother with anything else? No, I don't want a DeLorean, though. Well, nonetheless, the AZ1 is a really cool car, and it's probably a go-kart to drive because it's tiny and like Probably. Looking, looking inside of it, the, it's, it's almost like a baby C4 Corvette, how deep the channel was. You have to sit inside of to get inside of it. But I really like the car. It's and really I cool think car. it would fit in my garage, nose to tail, sideways. Like I could just push it to the slide, back and still fit back. two cars yeah. in there. Actually, you know what the, it, what the Sarah's doors are like? Uh, the McLaren F1. Okay. So they open like that. Like not quite a Lambo door, not quite a gullwing door, kind of an in-between door. All right. So, I mean, a McLaren F1 you could buy if you, you know. Hit the four hundred million dollar yeah. lottery, yeah, twice. <laughs> I don't have enough kidneys to sell. No, definitely not. I think the two of us together don't have enough kidneys to sell to buy for somebody else. Nope. But anyway, so yeah, that was the uh, kind of the rundown of the imported cars that were there, as far as gray market, not American, not American market cars. There are probably a few others too that were missing, but rotary swap cars, tons of rotary swap cars. What kind of chassis had most of the rotary swaps? Corollas. Because a lot of those roadies went into Corollas from probably third gens that were Ellis swapped. No, they're all early rotaries. Oh, okay. they're all carbureted twelve A's. And I, I think there was only one third gen RX7 that was Ellis swapped. It was an Ellis Turbo. It was the Turbo Ellis swap car that was there? Yeah. yeah, there were like three or four third gen RX7s, but one of them was Ellis swapped, mm-hmm. and it was wide body too. It was mm-hmm. actually it was a pretty tasteful wide body. Actually, it was a really good looking car, um, depending on. How you feel about several your, Mark IV Supras that you don't usually see a yep. lot of those. There's one bone stock one too in dark gray, mm-hmm. which is my favorite color on that car. Yep, it's very understated and kind of fits the understated look of the car. Um, where was I going with that Corollas? Oh yeah, so there were tons of rotary swap Corollas, which in the Northeast um, is kind of a regional thing. A lot of the um, the Puerto Rican car owners yep. do that down in Puerto Rico. So we have a higher uh, population in this area of Puerto Ricans that have used to doing it down in Puerto Rico, and they do it up here. Yeah. So there's quite a few more of those than there are in some other parts of the country, I'm sure. But there's several really big Toyota shows around here, too, right? Yep. Yeah, the uh, OSTC Old School Toyota Club. Yep. And then there's the Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the Rotary Club, the Bridgeport Rotaries, or Bridgeport, which is funny because it's one of the things you do to a rotary engine. Is Bridgeport or peripheral port? It yeah, they're not. Power. Are they related or just? Are you bridging the ports? Is that why it's called a bridge port? I don't know. Yes, one hundred percent. And yeah. it just so happened that they were probably. Hey, they're, we're near Bridgeport. They're Let's in Connecticut. In yeah, so they're. They, they, but the club is the Bridgeport uh, Rotary Engine Club or something like that. All right. So yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of there's an opportunity. Uh, yeah. Utilized well, opportunity well used. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a few of those around here, but. Um, most of those are really loud and really obnoxious and really cool. Yeah. Like obnoxious in a good way. I want to go to one of those big shows sometimes. We just... Oh, yeah, I there's, a, them. there's usually something going on. Like they're, the also, they're also usually like a two-hour drive from here. That's the problem. That's the truth. So it's not right around the corner. But nonetheless, yeah, we'll go to the next one for sure. I know our friend with the Celica goes all, to, to most of them. Mm-hmm. I've been to a couple of them with him. Um, not very many vintage SUVs. Nope. It was just your Montero and, and Chris's Delica. Chris's Delica and an FJ. Yep. Really clean FJ. Oh, but what about that Forerunner? Oh, yeah. It was like an early 90s Forerunner that was really clean, too. Like mm-hmm. a burgundy red. Mm-hmm. Um, jumping back to engine swaps, there were some interesting engine swap cars there. There was yeah. the typical LS1 RX7 you already talked about. Yep. There was an LS1 300ZX. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, well, it was. it was pretty... I hope he's not a listener because... It was pretty awful. Mm-hmm. It was a 2 plus 2, um, and it had a very inexpensive-looking paint job on it, and it had a very 
early 90s period correct invader style body kit as well. Oh. It was uh it was done it was interesting to say the least. It had a smooth engine bay that was also painted at the same time as the car. Oh. But it looks like I don't want to trash the car too much, but it's pretty trashy. Anyway, yeah. the <laughs> Celica. The Beam gray swap. Yeah. That car is really cool. That's actually a guy we've met before. His name is Omar. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a first-gen Celica. I think it's a 76, if I'm not incorrect, or 77. It's a, a liftback. It has bolt-on fender flares. Mm-hmm. It has a bolt-on spoiler on the rear. It's like a three-piece, like, C28 Camaro-style yep. spoiler. And the paint's, like, faded silver. It's like an original paint job on the car. Um, he had wheels made for it by that Indonesian company, Atara. The Atara racing wheels. They were some of the first ones in the country, I think, on his car. Um, they look like, like Watanabe's. They kind of like Watanabe style, yep. And cool backstory, the four spokes on my Colt came from that car when he bought it. So that car lives on a little bit in my car as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that car's really cool. And then our other favorite engine swap car at the show was the Mirage. It was a 7 Gen Mirage? Uh, yeah, whatever. It was the generation after the one we had. It yeah. was like a 99 Mirage. With a 2.4 Myvec 4G69. Right, which would have been out of a Rally Art Lancer. Yeah, or, Lancer Rally Or an Outlander. Uh, most likely it came out of a Lancer Rally Art. Yeah, most likely it came out of that. But one of those two vehicles. But uh, we don't usually, you don't usually see those cars done up at all. No. I mean, they're usually just commuter cars beat to death or rally cross cars beat to death <laughs> it was super super clean uh it's pearl white painted too yeah. a real nice paint job and it had uh Rega master evos on it yeah so it had wheels worth more than the car yeah which is fine we 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 we're, we're, we're uh, down it was that. pretty sweet yeah no it was really cool and actually it's funny because i actually walked by it and didn't pay it much attention at first for a second because i was like oh that's a civic and i'd already seen a bunch of civics and I was like, wait a second, that says Myvec on the valve cover because the hood was open. And then I realized that I was looking at a Mirage. Better than me, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> yeah, it was, really was, it was a true Mirage to yep. you, Andrew. <laughs> but no, it was, uh, it was a really cool car. Props to that guy for thinking outside the box and, and building that car really nice. I don't know what I had for suspension. I didn't get to talk to the owner of the car. But the fact that you saw a Mirage with the motor swap lowered nicely, not like stanced out. On the Rega uh, Masters, um, that five spoke traditional Japanese wheel that mm-hmm. everybody loves. It was just a really cool build. What about that Honda van pickup, city van or pick, city pickup? What was that it called? Um, Acti. Ah. A C T Y. Oh, so it's a K class delivery vehicle, pretty yep. much. A little three cylinder Honda. Um, that was really cool. Which is probably funny because in Japan they probably just like throw them away. Oh, yeah, they do. That's why they're... Because they're utilitarian yeah, trucks. and they've been cheap here for a long time yeah. because they've been importing them for... Farm trucks. Yeah, farm trucks or, like, campus vehicles. Or I know um, when I was in um, New York at Niagara Falls, the Niagara Falls Parks Department uses uh, little Honda vans. The same the same vehicle, but a van versus a pickup truck huh. to drive around the property with, which I thought was strange. I was like, man, those are illegal. I can't have one. At the time, they weren't old enough, but hmm. now they are. So, yeah, that was really cool. Um, missed opportunity of the day. What? That MX-63 Cressida. Yeah, well. Because uh, that car is from Salem, where we're both from. Actually, It's actually from Florida, but it made its way to Salem by the owner's, the original owner's son inherited the car, and he had offered it to me for sale. But at the time, I was like, nah, I don't really like the MX-63, which would be the second-gen Cressida. I was like, I, I prefer the first-gen or the third-gen. And I never even went and looked at it. And then we saw this there car at the show, and it had a cool two-tone paint job, and it was lowered on a set of SSR Mark 1s. Yep. And it just sat right, and we're looking at it, talking about it, and the kid's from Salem, so we're talking to him about you know being from Salem and not ever seeing the car around. And he told me who he bought it from, and it made me immediately regretful of all decisions in life because <laughs> that car was really good looking, and I could have had it for not much money, but didn't even bother looking at it because I just cast it aside in my head as an MX-63, and most of them are brown and not very interesting looking. So my mind has been changed. 
I will not turn down the next MX-63 that comes my way. Well, there you go. So, I'm not, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I didn't get it, but at least it went to a good home. Motorcycles were invited to the show. Um, yes. And in years past, they've had, like, motorcycle parking area, but not this year. No, and it made for some unsettling parking areas. Yeah. I know that uh, my father, in particular, was one of them because he was parked in an end spot. Yeah. And then they parked motorcycles all around him. Yeah. Which normally is not a big deal, but the show field is grass. So all these motorcycles that were, like, leaned over on their kickstands on grass, you immediately have the image in your head of that kickstand sinking into the grass and the bike falling over the car. Well, uh, I believe it was the 2010 event. I was there with my Evo 10. And you oh, the guy, oh, yeah, you had experience with this. Yeah, thing. the guy was rolling in in like a mid-90s Honda Superbike. Yep. And I don't know, he said he got like a leg cramp or something. He drops he drops the bike. Yeah, he didn't he hit just, my he car. He's a bad rider. Yeah. And then he, but in his like, he's doing this like owie jump move. He's lay, He's laying on my hood. My aluminum hood of my car. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. It was so bullshit. Yeah. That was a bad moment. Yeah. Thankfully, there was no damage, though. Yeah. Somehow. Because it was a big man in a leather jacket. Yeah. Laying across the hood of your car. Yeah. It was not It was not good. Um, so, I I don't know who we got to talk to about that for next year, but they need to be separated from the cars. Yeah. If not for an actual incident happening this year, just the... There were a lot. It wasn't just my father. There were a lot of uneasy, un, uneasy car owners that could see something bad happening in that situation. Well, they don't even come. They had like a. They have a nice area that's like under a tree. You just put the motorcycles there, which I think they've done in years. They past. used to do. They used yeah. to all the motorcycles parked together, yeah. not yeah. just like strewn about the field like they did yeah. this year. Yeah. But I know another thing that made my father nervous was the bike that was immediately next to him. The owner's son was probably like twelve, and he kept like walking over to it, and like sitting on it to relax during the day. Which my father was like, not, not only is there a bike there, now there's a child sitting on it, and this is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure if he was there in a different car, he probably would have moved his car because he was that nervous about it. So, But, yeah, we need to see if we can talk to somebody about getting that taken care of next year because that was not cool. I know they have on um, Tutto Italiano, the Italian vehicle day, mm-hmm. they have motorcycles there for that show, and they're on top of the hill on the pavement section, which is actually where they were last year for Japanese Bike Day, too, like near the entrance to the museum mm. on that pa- where that Yamaha was that we came out and saw. That, mm-hmm. that uh, I don't even remember what it was. It was a big uh, 600 it was single. 600 single, yeah. It was a cool bike. It wasn't a big bike. It was a small bike, but it was a 600 single. Like SX6 or something? Something like that. It was a cool bike. S6X. I've never seen before. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so we need to do something about that, but... Nothing did happen, so no harm, no foul. Just don't want anything to happen in the future. Uh, let's see. Car show behavior. There was some bad behavior present, unfortunately. And I wanted to talk about that because I think it's something to do with the crowd that comes to an all-Japanese show, whereas you have a lot of the like hot import nights crowd mm-hmm. that does show up. Not a ton of them, but enough of them showed up. So we had that one car was revving really loudly. Mm-hmm. And then, like, a hundred people went running across the car show to go look at it for some reason, mm-hmm. even though you could hear it quite loud and clear from everywhere. Um, a few people were doing, like, burnouts and drifting out of the parking lot when they left. That's, like, every show there? Yeah, it seemed more... Maybe it's because I, I, I'm i more invested in the show, and I don't want to see it stopped. That maybe it bothered me Literally a little bit Literally every more. show there. Yeah. I don't know. It just, it just bothered me a little bit more. Um... There was a Honda SI, Civic SI, that took off and made a lot of ruckus, which is pretty annoying. Um, and then there were, like, four kids sitting behind the rotary-swapped Corollas in the far corner of the show, just smoking pot all day. Which is not acceptable car show behavior. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I, don't, I don't understand. There was a police detail there, so whatever. Yeah, well, it's, again, is it? I mean, I don't, I don't know the legalities of smoking pot in a public park. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to. I don't know currently now any, either. Yeah, <laughs> but regardless, it's not like it's a family-friendly like environment. Like they don't allow alcohol, but I don't think it says no smoking pot on the signs. So yeah. I just I I just think it was kind of rude. 
I mean, I'm not trying to be old man Brad here, but there's a time and a place, man. And that wasn't the time or the place. Or maybe it was the right time, but it wasn't the right place. So I just, I don't know. Whatever. It just, it just, it hit me the wrong way. I mean, what's the difference with somebody and their stupid vape or uh, smoking a big old cigar? At, no, I just, at, I, at I, Italian I, Garde. Yeah, I dislike that as well. Um, I don't know, just the, the stigma of the marijuana smell, I guess. It just, and the kids were being really loud and obnoxious and being kids. And I don't know. I just, all, all right. right. Maybe I am being <laughs> old man Brad, but yeah, get off, get off my, my damn lawn, get man. Get off my lawn event, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, nonetheless, other than those minor little quibbles aside, it was a really good show. Um, friend of the show, who we have not yet convinced to be on the show, but have mentioned often, Chris with his Delica van won Best Mitsubishi. Yep. So we told him he's not allowed to bring it next year because that's two years in a row, and he's got to give it to somebody else. <laughs> Obviously, we're kidding. He's more than welcome to bring it next year. But it's a uh, the voting there is a um, popular vote. Yeah. So. And a lot of vintage stuff won. Yeah, which I was actually pretty happy about that no modern cars won anything. I don't think even the tuner class was won by a modern car. I think that was also won by a vintage car. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I think Best Subaru went to that old brown GL. It, did. it was a brown GL we didn't even talk about. It was a survivor car yeah. in New England. It was a 64,000-mile Subaru GL, um, brown with a tan interior. It was actually like the Subaru equivalent to my 80 Colt. It was almost yeah. the same color with the same color interior, same hatchback style. Just a lot cooler. Oh, listen, listen, you know. <laughs> buys one Subaru, buys two Subarus. Next thing you know, he's talking up Subarus over my Mitsubishi. I don't want to hear it, Andrew. Um, yeah, the best tuner car actually went to an AE86 Corolla. So I did go to an old car. Was it that black one? It was the black one, yeah. That was gorgeous. Nice car. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Best Mitsu went to Chris, Best Tuner Car went to that, Best Subaru went to the um, GL, Best Nissan Datsun went to the black Datsun Roadster. Yep. Um, what else is there? Best Honda went to the white pickup truck, the Acti. Okay. And what other brand is there? We got Honda, Subaru. Give Toyota. Yep. Toyota. I don't know what won, what won best Toyota. A, the A86. No, he won best tuner. Oh, oh, they oh! Didn't give him both awards. I don't think. I don't know who won best Toyota. It might have been that FJ. Yeah, whatever. It may have been. I I, I do not know which car won that. And I don't. Oh, know which I car feel like it was the Mazda. limousine. Okay, which parked next to the FJ. Yeah. So it was one of those cars. And I do not know what car won best Mazda. Oh, the AutoZam won best Mazda. Okay. So, which I think it should have gone to Cosmo, but popular vote rules. So. Whatever. Yeah, no, it doesn't really matter. So, scale project cars. Yes, um, haven't really done much with scale project cars, but went to a scale project cars event. Yes. So we did. Uh, I actually, I should say, I did. You did because Andrew did not go. Um, Classic Plastic, which is yeah. a local model car club. I went to a museum in Salem. Yes, which is also a cool take. I'm sure. Um, not car related though, so we'll skip that. For tonight. Yeah, it was about vintage cruise liners, which is kind of cool, but yeah, totally off topic. Yes, too far off topic, I think, <laughs> to make a subject about. Uh, but classic plastic, they're a local model car club based out of Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, they do an annual show every year in October, November. Um, haven't made it in a few years, but decided to go this year. Really good turnout, few hundred models on the tables, which is good. Um, our friend of the show, D, Degon, he has, uh, I think he's at Degon on Instagram. Pretty sure? I think so. Yeah, he's got a bunch of really good builds on there if you want to check him out. Um, I should look it up real quick. but And a nice lowered Forester, too. He's a Subaru guy. He does own a Subaru, yes. Which, actually, I was talking to him. He's talking about replacing it. Well, anyway. Um, I'm not sure with what. Um, anyway, yeah, he's not popping right up in my thing, so I'll move on. Um, I think his name is, yeah. I'll I think, I think, I think he's I'll, at Degon. I'll look yeah. it up while you finish this. Uh, so he came. He won quite a few awards for his clean builds. He builds mostly imported cars um, and just has a super clean building style with a really, I don't know, really good eye for detail and really good eye for making things look real. Um, he invited some of his modeling friends um, from New Jersey to come up. And Vision 24, whose first name I don't remember, he's kind of, he's a published author about model stuff and 
He's pretty pretty famous on the internet as far as models go. Uh, came from New Jersey, chatted with him for a little bit. Really cool guy. Also really clean builds. Um, he's just Vision24, the number 24 on Instagram. Um, Andrew and I went to the other hobby show uh, a few months back. And we were complaining about the prices on the vendor areas. This particular show was much better. Uh, I managed to walk out of there with four kits for under $30 total, which is pretty good if you know current kit prices. Most of them are 20 to $40 a piece. So I didn't need to buy kits, but... They were a good deal, and they were kits that I've kind of had my eye on for a while, and they were, you know, 5 to $10 each, so I went with them. Also picked up a Mazda Dealer promo poster from 1984, which was a cross-promotion with BF Goodrich and Mazda. One of them is a the, – the big posters, Andrew, what size would you say those are? I, don't know, I can't even think of what they are. Probably like 24 by 36. They're normal poster size. Probably, yeah. I think it's an A1 poster size. Yeah, whatever that normal size is. Um, but one was in the th- three-tone orange, yellow, brown, kind of sunset stripe style RX-7 rally car from the SCCA Pro Rally. Yeah. Actually, it would have been Pro Rally at 85, right? Yes. Yeah. So from the SCCA Pro Rally. And the other one was a shot of the uh, 323 um, from the SCCA Showroom Stock Series. Uh, really cool posters, but $5 for a pair of them was pretty awesome. Uh, I didn't enter any cars, unfortunately, any models, because I wasn't planning on spending all day there. So I just went and spectated. Next year, I'll make sure to build something to go with it. Um, I'd say that it's by far the best of the local model car shows, Andrew. Yep. Um, isn't much better. You got a picture of that car right there? Yeah, that would have been Rod Millen. In the, it was Rod Millen's car. In yeah. the four-wheel drive Monster RX-7. That's the car, And yep. Well, actually... I gotta look at it. Was it a number one or a number five? Because number one was Rod, and number five was Steve Millen, so his son. Oh, okay. Well, I know it said Millen on the car. I'm right not sure which one it was. I mean, the family, they're synonymous with motorsports. Oh, 100%. Because they run, hit their son, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, the RAV4. Reese. No, Reese Millen is his dad. Oh. There's now, like, the grandson. So it's Reese, Rod, Steve. I think Steve is a brother. Then there's Reese. And then his son is driving the RAV4 right now, and I'm blanking on it. And you don't have a book for new cars. No, but I have Instagram. It's uh, Ryan Millen. Ryan Millen. Yep. Which is the name that was on the tip of my tongue. I was like, I think it's Ryan, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to be wrong. Yep. Uh, but anyway, I'd say it's by far the, probably the best of the local model car events, um, just because it always has the most stuff and... I don't know. It's just yeah. the better location. It's close. Maybe it's because it's 10 minutes from my house. I don't know. I'm mostly jealous better. about those posters. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. I would have probably knocked you over if I saw those posters. Well, it was funny because there. they have all the vendors for you know, old model car stuff, mm-hmm. and it was just a brown poster tube, and I didn't even pay it any attention until, like, my fifth trip through the vendor section, and I saw that it had a Mazda logo on the return address. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that could be something interesting in there, and it clearly was. Um, so I think that the photographer was there taking pictures of the models and it's going to be in the magazine called conveniently enough model cars magazine oh that checks out yes um anything else scale car wise i went looking for the uh was it future classics i think the modern new? modern classics modern classics yeah, the, hot, set. the new hot wheel series you're talking yes. about yeah modern classics um i was hoping i'd get lucky and i only found the r5 which is funny because I have a complete set minus the R5. Yeah, I really want that Benz. That's really the only one I want. Maybe the 964 if I can find it. Right. Now the Benz is really cool. It's a 190 so, Evo 2. Yeah, I already told you. If you find another Benz, I will trade you the R5 for the Benz. Right. I need to find two more Benzes then. <laughs> so, I would call that a podcast. I would say so. So, something important. Uh, again, if you like our podcast... Please go on Facebook and like our page and set it to receive updates first. Uh, If you want to ask us questions, this will make it easier for you to see those posts. Um, And, of course, you can follow us on Instagram, Auto Off Topic. Another place to see when we're asking questions. That's right. And we'll take questions on Instagram. We'll take them on Facebook. You can also email us, autooftopic at gmail.com. 
com. If you have any questions, complaints, corrections. We haven't had to do any corrections in a while. No, I don't think it's because we're right. I just think it's because people haven't been correcting us. Yeah. We'll totally take corrections. So. Yeah. Um, Criticisms, corrections, anything you want to do. Yep. You can uh, follow me at Race and Anger. And Brad? You can follow me at TSISS350 or at my business page, which is Vintage Imports of NE on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and I know we have a, a bumper ad running before the episode goes, but don't forget about the coloring contest. Um, I will be posting pictures of some of the prizes in the next couple of weeks and so. Uh, some pretty cool stuff out there. So get your colored pencils and markers and mouses, I guess. Well, there's only a couple of weeks left. So yeah. so I'll, I'll get... You should probably pictures. start doing that this weekend. Yes. I'll, I'll get pictures of the prizes put up soon. I'll put yep. it that way. All right. Uh as always, please rate and review us on iTunes, and of course, share. Thanks for listening, and keep cars analog.